So hi everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about Blueborn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so Blueborn um, is a new attack vector we have discovered in the last uh, year. It's an airborne attack vector because it's uh, wireless. Uh, it uses Bluetooth. Um, today our talk specifically is going to be focused on uh, Linux devices, on IoT Linux devices and the, vul the vulnerabilities in the Bluetooth that we found in the implementation um, in Linux. So, my name is Ben Seri, I'm the head of research at Armis, and today with me is... I'm Greg, I'm also a researcher at Armis. Um, and we both work uh, in, in Armis, which is an IoT security company that is focused on the unmanaged devices uh, in, in each corporate organization. Um, discovering these devices, profiling them, and uh, sanctioning them. And for that reason, we came across uh, searching, researching Bluetooth to understand how some of these devices communicate. And through understanding Bluetooth, uh, we found um, a magnitude of eight uh, vulnerabilities um, in different operating systems. So today, I'm going to talk a, a bit about other airborne attacks that have been discovered in the last year, wireless attacks. Uh, a bit of Bluetooth background that is necessary to understand the vulnerabilities and how they can be exploited. We're going to talk about specifically the Bluetooth stack in, in Linux, which is called Blues. And then a remote exp exploita exploitation, uh, um, how we did the remote exploitation of these vulnerabilities uh, in the RC vulnerability we found in the Linux kernel. On two devices, we are going to show this on the Amazon Echo and the Samsung uh, uh, Gear um, smartwatch. And hopefully, if all goes well with the setup, uh, we're going to do a live demo of this uh, at the end of our talk as well. So in the last year, there have been uh, a lot of research in wireless uh, security, um, really groundbreaking research. And uh, in Broadcom chips, um, two major research was done one by uh, Exodus, it's called Broadpon, and the other by Project Zero's researcher. Um, both found RC vulnerabilities in Broadcom Wi-Fi chips, which are really prevalent in a lot of devices, uh, which um, allows you to take over devices over Wi-Fi, which use Broadcom uh, in devices that use Broadcom chips. Uh, another Wi-Fi uh, research was a uh, crack, is going to be here tomorrow, um, the researcher. Uh, you've probably heard of it. It's uh, protocol flaws in Wi-Fi that enable the attacker to either decrypt or even inject, in some cases, uh, Wi-Fi packets in secure networks. And lastly, our own research, Blueborn, was also found uh, this year uh, on Bluetooth uh, vulnerabilities. So this is a, a field in which a lot of uh, research is being done. Um, and although we feel there have, there have been uh, previous research, it seems that more work is, is needed to secure uh, wireless uh, communications. So Blueborn is an attack vector that targets um, a lot of uh, devices that use Bluetooth, uh, in which of, uh, one of the five operating systems uh, in, uh, that we found vulnerabilities in. So it's Android, Windows, Linux, and iOS. And it's really a very powerful attack vector since it uh, and affected some, so many devices, 5.3 billion devices were at risk from, the, uh, from these vulnerabilities. It is actually a subset of eight vulnerabilities which affect each operating system a bit differently. And they, they are the most severe uh, Bluetooth vulnerabilities that we know of to date. And this is because uh, these vulnerabilities enable an attacker either to gain remote code execution, to get code execution on, on devices, to do many in the middle attacks, um, so to inject or um, sniff packets, network packets uh, from the, from without authentication, and information leak vulnerabilities that enable attacker either to bypass mitigations or just to leak crucial data from devices. Uh, the reason these vulnerabilities are so severe because they do not require any user interaction or any authentication, um, and an attacker can just bypass and attack a device uh, remotely without uh, anyone knowing that, hap that it happened. Um, in the diagram here, you can just see um, the Bluetooth stack or a part of, the, of, a, of a typical Bluetooth stack 
and all the different aid vulnerabilities that we found and where our in their location in the stack is. And, and as you can see, the, the vulnerabilities are not um, in one specific area in the stack. They are actually all across the stack, uh, each vulnerability affecting another, a different operating system. Um, so uh, either the RC vulnerabilities or the man-in-the-middle vulnerabilities or the information leak vulnerabilities, each are uh, across the stack. And this is just um, a testament to the fact that no specific part is vulnerable, but the general feeling that the stack has, the Bluetooth implementations have not been audited enough. And so for that reason, we found so many vulnerabilities. And now Greg is going to talk about uh, discoverability, which is a main concept in Bluetooth. And it is the first step that is needed to, uh, for an attacker to bypass in order to attack Bluetooth devices. OK. So there is a, a common misconception in Bluetooth uh, that two devices, in order to communicate, uh, need to pair with each other. And in the case of, 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 uh, of in the general case of normal devices, that is true. Uh, when, when they don't know each other yet, uh, during this pairing they exchange identifiers, uh, the main of which is their uh, Bluetooth address. It's just a MAC address, it's a six byte address. Uh, however, once uh, a device or an attacker knows these six bytes, this address, uh, he or she can communicate with that device even when it's not discoverable. Uh, so on most operating systems, uh, Bluetooth devices are always listening to incoming connections. They're not always discoverable, but they're always listening for incoming connections, almost in all cases, when Bluetooth is turned on. And it is turned on by default on most machines that have Bluetooth hardware. So again, a device does not need to be discoverable in order for an attacker to use Bluetooth uh, as a vector. Uh, in addition uh, to this map uh, identifying a device, uh, it's also Part of it, a significant part of it, is also transmitted plain text over the air in every Bluetooth packet. Uh, so that means if two devices are communicated via Bluetooth, uh, an attacker uh, that is nearby and can sniff the radio uh, can get basically 80% of that address out of the air from a single packet, and then brute force the rest, which is on 32 options or so, uh, and is able to communicate with one of the devices. Uh, now, this isn't new. Uh, open source tools, hardware tools have existed uh, for a long time doing this. Here we're showing the Ubertooth tool. It costs about 100 bucks. Uh, it's been available for some years now. And basically what it does is that an attacker puts it on some Bluetooth channel, and it's, uh, it's just listening for packets uh, from any device to any device and picks them up. And basically, it shows the addresses of communicating devices in the air, even when they're not discoverable. The only thing they need to do is to actually communicate. Uh, now, this was a hardware solution that cost 100 bucks. Uh, software, purely software solutions do exist uh, for that. Uh, it's possible to uh, modify uh, the firmware of existing uh, Bluetooth adapters or Bluetooth chips. Uh, it's pretty difficult, uh, but work on this has been done in the past, and we've seen examples that do that. Uh, we actually found something both cheaper and simpler, um, a, a sub $1 solution, if you will. And uh, this is using uh, uh, this uh, NRF24 uh, chipset or module that you can buy on Alibaba for less than a dollar. Uh, it's based on this NRF24 chipset, which is used for wireless keyboards and mice, which actually uh, the Microsoft and Logitech and a, a few other companies, they don't use Bluetooth for their keyboards and mice. They use something that's called a proprietary protocol over 2.4 gigahertz, uh, which just so happens to be on the same channels, frequencies, and modulated exactly the same as Bluetooth, but it's not Bluetooth. Uh, so we found a trick, well, a trick, simply to configure this device in a way that will sniff Bluetooth. And additionally, uh, there has been research done in the past of how to promiscuously sniff max of keyboards and mice uh, from these adapters uh, by a researcher called uh, Travis Goodspeed. You might have heard of him. Um, so we combined these two tricks in order to get uh, basically uh, the same functionality as the, uh, as the Ubertooth and be able to sniff out uh, Bluetooth addresses from the air. Uh, the code for this is on our GitHub. Um, it's a Python script. Which no, is just after the talk, it's going to be on the GitHub. OK. <laughs> Fine. Uh, OK. Now, in addition to, to, 
to the things I've shown before, it's also pretty uh, common for equipment manufacturers, OEMs, to, to uh, set either the same or adjacent MAC addresses to the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, uh, chipset. Uh, so basically, uh, lots of existing hardware uh, is on the market that can sniff Wi-Fi in monitor mode. So if you just sniff Wi-Fi packets of a device and it has Bluetooth enabled, and it's one of the majority, I suppose, of devices where the Bluetooth address is adjacent, then you also know the Bluetooth address, basically. So that's also a way. And even a step further, if the attacker is both in proximity physically and on the same network, then they can know the MAC address, the Wi-Fi MAC address and the Bluetooth address uh, just from doing, looking at its ARP cache. Okay, so now we can communicate with the Bluetooth device. Uh, how do we attack it? Bluetooth is a, has a very large attack surface. Uh, what you see here, uh, the boxes above are the uh, profiles and services of Bluetooth. These are the higher level things uh, that you know of, like uh, Ethernet uh, tethering or sound or stuff like that, HID. Um, there are lots of those. Uh, one of them is called uh, SDP. It's the Service Discovery Protocol. It's a protocol that allows you to discover what other protocols are available on the device. Um, below that is the L2 cap layer. Uh, the L2 cap layer is basically the transport layer, uh, the reliable transport layer. It's like TCP for Bluetooth in many ways. And below that are the hardware communication with, with the Bluetooth adapter and the packet layers, ACL and such. Uh, a lot of these services, they do not require authentication to connect. For instance, SDP, obviously, by design. Um, and except for that huge attack surface, it's all extremely complicated. Uh, the spec that defines most of this stuff that you see here uh, is very long. Uh, some pages look like this one. Uh, and this one particularly, what it shows is a, a what's called a packet fragmentation uh, that's implemented in four different layers up to and including L2 cap. Why would you need that? I don't know, but it exists. Now, every time uh, packet fragmentation is something that's pretty bug prone in implementation, so every implementation has four chances of getting it wrong, uh, and they do. Um, and now in this talk, we're going to talk about the Blues implementation, which is the Linux implementation of Bluetooth. It's been around since 2001, and you may know that Bluetooth has been around from 1998. It's actually the first native OS Bluetooth stack that exists inside uh, Linux. And what it does is talk to Bluetooth controllers, to, to the hardware devices, uh, it has a kernel side implementation of the lower protocols. The uh, HCI is the communication with the hardware, ACL is the packet protocol, and L2CAP is the TCP transport protocol. Uh, besides that, there is a user land implementation in a daemon called Bluetooth D. Uh, it does uh, pairing and authentication, the higher level stuff. It provides those services, including SDP, and it runs as root. So interestingly, all this huge attack surface, all of it runs at least as root, and some of it in the kernel. Uh, and now Ben is going to talk to you particularly about a vulnerability that we found in the L2CAP layer in Linux. Yes. So as Greg was saying, L2CAP is the Bluetooth equivalent of TCP. It is a transport, transport layer. Um, so it is like TCP. Um, it, 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 does a connection, it, it, it does the connection to the servers, to the services. Um, and it offers um, some quality of service features, so it, it can have, you can have a reliable connection over the non-reliable ACL packets. Uh, so basically, um, like TCP, you can have your service uh, listening for incoming connections, and you have a Bluetooth client connecting to it, um, and L2CAP will be that transfer player that will allow that connection to take place. Since it offers um, a lot of quality of service features, there is a lot of code um, in, in, to implement those features, so there was an, a wide attack surface in, in L2CAP. And as Greg uh, mentioned before, L2CAP in Blues specifically is implemented inside the kernel, so uh, vulnerability there might be very vulnerable, may, may, very um, good to an attacker. So there is a concept in L2CAP that's called mutual configuration. Um, it helps do the um, quality of service uh, negotiation in the start of the connection. The connection parameters um, are negotiated 
um, in this process. And the way it works is that device A in this diagram will send a configuration request message, which will basically have uh, plenty of options, plenty of configuration elements in it, like the MTU of the connection, like uh, what quality of service features you want to implement in that connection, and so on. And, uh, he will send that uh, message to device B. Device B will then either accept that configuration or reject it with a configuration response message. And if he chooses to reject it, he can offer an alternative configuration parameters. Um, so he can change the MTU or other uh, connection uh, parameters and send, and send them in the configuration response message. If he rejects them, device A will then offer another uh, configuration with another configuration request and so on, and they will nego negotiate until they reach an agreement on the uh, parameters. In this process, it's called mutual configuration because it happens in both ways. So each device will uh, negotiate uh, its sides of the connection parameters, sending the co configuration request, and the same will happen um, vice versa on the other end. So here we can see an example of this uh, process. Device A on the left will send the configuration re request with a no number of options uh, in the message of the correct configuration parameters. And device B on the right will send a configuration response. In this instance, uh, the result is failure. So he unaccepted the parameters and he offered to change some parameter in some way. The, like I said before, in device A, when he re receives this configuration response message, he will then need to build another configuration request message and continue the negotiation process. And this is exactly the me mechanism, the negotiation process here, uh, in which we found the RC vulnerability in the kernel. So this function parses the configuration response, so the messages that, that are being returned uh, to the config configuration re request. Um, and then it needs to build an output configuration request message that will be returned uh, so the configuration process will continue. And looking at the prototype of the function, we notice that something is missing. The highlighted the arguments there, or the RSP uh, variable, is the input configuration response message pointer. The len is that length of that message. And then data pointer is the, the out parameter. It's the configuration request message that will be built in the process of parsing this input message and returned uh, to, the, to the other peer. And the data, data argument doesn't have a length attached to it. So this function doesn't know what are the bounds, what is the size of this data pointer. And it just copies uh, the input configuration elements from one end, from, from the response message to the new request message that is being built. And there is no validation of the bounds of uh, this uh, memory pointer, of the data pointer here. Um, and the while loop there just goes and uh, gets um, all the configuration elements from the message, from the input message, and copies them or changes them, changes them depending on the, their uh, data into the out, into the data pointer uh, that is uh, pointed with uh, PTR over there. So this function, this uh, L2K parse conf RSP function is vulnerable. It can write out of bounds to the data pointer that it receives. What is that pointer? So in this um, context, it is the buff pointer that is being passed, passed to it. This, is, this function is the function that receives the configuration response messages. So buff here is just a 64-byte uh, buffer on the stack. So obviously, a stack overflow can be uh, abused in this flow. The only caveat here is that um, the device needs to be in the pending state, which actually is a state that the attacker has uh, a lot of control over. So prior to sending this overflow message, he can send another message that will put the device uh, in the pending state, and then the overflow can be triggered. So what, what is the strategy for this exploit? It is a classic stack overflow, like the 90s, like the good old days. So it shouldn't be too hard, but there are uh, some limitations. Uh, we need the ability to send whatever configuration response messages we'd like because um, it is not usually that, uh, the way it works. Usually you have your stack and it will do the negotiation. It will send whatever configuration response messages it like. So we, so we developed a small testing fr framework for us to send raw uh, configuration response messages. Um, we're going to do a stack overflow, but we want to know what are, what are we going to overflow. We want to choose uh, our overflow very specifically, so we need to find either pointers or, or uh, the return address of the function uh, to overflow. 
And simultaneously, the buffer that we are going to use to overflow also needs to be a valid configuration response message, because in the loop here, uh, in the while loop here, if we send an invalid configuration response message, configuration element, the while loop would break and our overflow would stop. So we, it also has to be a valid uh, response message. Um, if there are any mitigations in the device that we are attacking, uh, we need to bypass them bef before we trigger the overflow, either KSLR or stack canaries. And once we do the overflow, what we want is to develop, develop a write word where primitive. So we have a control to write some data in some address in the memory. Um, and that would allow us either to, to insert a warp chain or do a, a simple shell code that would be run inside um, the kernel once we have that primitive. We want a way to get out of the kernel to user space. That would be simpler to do. Um, post-exploitation. So we're going to use user mode helpers, which we're going to talk about later, to do this process. Uh, and lastly, if there are any LSM models, Linux security models, like SE Linux or, or others, we want to disable them before going uh, to user space because we are in kernel, we have that ability, so it'd be really nice to do that. So what are the expected mitigations in 2017 in any Linux device? Uh, what we expect to find in devices. ASLR is address, address space randomization. Uh, it would be uh, hard for an attacker to know the addresses which you need uh, to do the stack overflow, so that is to be expected. Stack canaries are very basic, uh, very uh, good uh, mitigation to prevent stack overflows. Um, Fortify source is a feature for, for, for uh, even hardening stack canaries, canaries even more, so to put the stack buffers adjacent to the canaries, so if an attacker were, were to overflow that buffer, it would go into the canary, uh, and he has to know with canary to uh, exploit this. And annex bit is a very basic uh, feature in a lot of devices that is used to prevent data from being executed and code from be, being writable. So the attacker cannot simply jump to its shell code um, either on the stack or in a different part in the memory. What are the real-world kernel configurations that we actually find? KSLR, the ASLR of the kernel, is not really enabled in any devices. It, it was only added to the, current, to the default configuration of the kernel in very recent versions. Um, and it is a hassle for a lot of uh, devices to use it. Uh, so it's actually not being enabled at all, um, at least in devices that have Bluetooth, that's, that's the case. Um, Stack canaries are only enabled in the major Linux distributions. They are not in the default configuration of the kernel for some reason. Um, so any devi device that uses mainline kernel just with the default configuration uh, will not necessarily enable them. We actually haven't been able to find any IoT devices that use stack canaries, although they are very basic uh, mitigation. There is the funny case of Fortify source being enabled, but stack canary is disabled. This is not a good combination because uh, if you have enabled Fortify source, the stack buffers will, will be placed on the bottom of the stack, and then the first overflow will be of the frame pointer uh, or the return address, so you instantly have control over something that's, that is significant. And this is actually the case of the Samsung smartwatch that we have exploited. Um, no NX bit. We, we were really surprised to find out that the Amazon Echo does not, does not use the NX bit or uses it poorly. We are, we're not really sure. Um, so we can do it like the 90s, we can just dump, jump to our shell code in the stack. So we have tested uh, two devices um, for this uh, RC vulnerability. One is the Samsung smartwatch. It runs uh, a pretty new kernel, not that old, the kernel uh, 3.18. Um, it runs a pr an ARM processor 64-bit. It has very few mitigations, no case allow, no stack canaries. It has the funny combination of Fortify source enabled, stack canaries disabled. Um, it also has Smack, which is in some um, alternative to SC Linux, but we can uh, mitigate, we can bypass that once we have a uh, code execution in the kernel. And the second case study is the Amazon Echo, uh, which is based on a very old kernel for some reason. It's 2.6 uh, kernel. Um, it runs on ARM 32-bit, and it has virtually no mitigations at all. Uh, no KSLR, no stack canaries, no Fortify source, no NXP, no access control. Um, in that case, there is no Fortify source, but it actually works in our benefit. We're going to show that uh, 
um, because we can overflow something that is not the stack pointer or the frame pointer, and we that point the the fact is that there's a very very nice and va valuable pointer for the attacker that is pretty adjacent to the overflow buffer. Amazon has provided a patch for this just um, two weeks ago. Uh, so now Greg is going to talk about the limited RC flow we have in the old kernel that's run on the Echo. Okay, so initially when we looked at the Echo and we've seen that it has such an old kernel, uh, we actually didn't find that vulnerability that Ben has shown previously in this version because uh, it existed in its form uh, from Linux 3.3 and up. Uh, however, what we did find is that it does exist uh, from kernel 2.6.32 and up uh, in a more limited scenario. Uh, as you can see, the state that uh, that case needs to be in there is unaccepted in this case. Previously, it was in the pending state. Again, it doesn't really matter. This is attacker controlled, more or less. However, the limitation here is this if above there. Uh, and what it does is it checks that the size of the input uh, configuration uh, response message is 60 bytes. Uh, and if you remember, the buffer we're overflowing is 64 bytes. So that should be a problem, right? Well, it turns out that it, it really isn't. Uh, what uh, happens is that uh, the configuration parameters come in elements, and these elements are, uh, are built like uh, TLVs, tag length value uh, structures. Uh, so basically, uh, there is one byte for a type. In this case, type number four is uh, that case down there called uh, conf RFC. Uh, and the length can be zero, for example, so it, only two bytes are required to define a single element. But what this function does, this code is out of the same function that has the vulnerability, the original vulnerability in it. Uh, what this does is that the loop uh, goes over all the input uh, elements, and then uh, it does something with them, and it writes out elements into the output. However, in this case, as you can see, the element that is written out uh, is not of the, of the zero size that we've set, but of the actual real size for that element, which is that size of down there, which happens to be more than just these two bytes. Uh, so this means we can amplify the size uh, of our elements in, inside the output buffer. Uh, and what we are showing here, this is actually the actual stack frame from the Echo uh, on the previous version before it's patched. Uh, uh, on the left there is uh, our two byte, what we call the zero LAN RFC element. Uh, and on the right, what's written to the, to the stack frame, what's written to the output buffer, is an 11 byte element because uh, it has, it, it's supposed to be 11 bytes long. So for every two bytes, we can write 11 bytes. And if we do the math, it, in the math it shows that for the 60 bytes that we can uh, input, we get 330 bytes of output, which is a lot more than 64 bytes that we should have had. Uh, one thing that is uh, uncomfortable here is that the data is uncontrolled. This uh, is uninitialized, what it's writing there in that uh, element. OK. So uh, we looked at the stack of the stack frame itself on the echo. Uh, and uh, as Ben said, it has no uh, Fortify source, uh, and therefore it is not adjacent to the uh, return address or the uh, saved registers. However, there's something more interesting there. The buffer is slightly uh, above on the stack from a pointer called PTR, which you can see here, this is actually the pointer of where the next element is written to. So an element is parsed, pointer is updated to the next element in the output buffer. So if we overflow that with an element and we control what was written, then we control where the next element will be written. Uh, this gives us our write what where primitive. This is sort of what we want to do. Uh, however, uh, there is an annoying uh, limitation. Simply writing those 24 zero length RFCs uh, will not allow us to control the pointer. It will overflow it, but the data will be uncontrolled. So uh, we need to, to massage it in some way to find a, a solution to that. So basically, there are other elements except for RFC. They have different sizes. In this case, it's the flash and MTU elements. So uh, we build our input buffer in such a way that uh, what, what happens is that there are 22 empty RFCs that will uh, bring us further away in, on the stack frame. And then we use other elements, in this case, flash elements, to align ourselves to our right. And lastly, we can write uh, two controlled bytes anywhere we want uh, uh, there. Well, basically, uh, where we align it to. Uh, the place we align it on is onto this uh, pointer. This pointer, again, controls where the next element will be written to. 
In particular here, we overflow the first two bytes of that pointer, and this is a little endian R machine. The first two bytes are the two least significant bytes of the address. Uh, this pointer is an address to the stack, so uh, overflowing the two least significant uh, bytes of an address on the stack lets us then write anywhere basically on the stack. Uh, and this is uh, what we do. What you can see here is that at first uh, we send all our elements that overflow PTR and we write uh, the two least significant bytes of where the next element will be written. And on the right, you see where we write those bytes, and we overflow the LR register on the save register, which is the return address of the function. We overflow two bytes here, because that's kind of our limitation. And we can do that with a single uh, L2CAP uh, conf response uh, command. Uh, so it's kind of a problem writing just two bytes, but it turns out that Bluetooth being so complicated is good for us, as w again. Uh, uh, basically, it's possible in L2CAP to put multiple commands into one packet. And in addition to that, there is a fragmentation layer below L2CAP at, on ACL, which allows us to now build really large L2CAP packets. So basically, we can pack together lots and lots of these commands, uh, and, and then in a single packet, write uh, however many bytes we want uh, on the stack. Uh, so what we'll do with that is at first write a shell code somewhere on the stack. Again, there is no NX bit on this device, so we can just write a shell code. And then uh, overflow, the, uh, overflow with uh, two times two bytes the return address. Uh, there is a small caveat here. You may see that uh, there are uncontrolled two bytes written in addition to our controlled two bytes, so we need to write them in reverse. Uh, not a problem. Uh, and then our shell code will be executed. Uh, as you can see here, uh, if you can see, uh, on the left there is that huge packet. It contains many, uh, it, it, it's over ACL fragmentation, it's pretty large, and it contains many L2CAP commands, the, which are the configure responses. And on the right is a particular single configuration response that has many of these empty RFC elements. These are the empty options that you see there, Wireshark can parse it. And uh, lastly, there are the two flash elements that are used to actually write data. Okay, so now Ben is going to explain what you actually do with this uh, post, as post-exploitation. Yes. Uh, so ha as we said, we now uh, have a kind of remote code execution, but we want something more convenient for us. We want to have a word shell. And for that, we use a very nice uh, concept that uh, exists inside the Linux kernel, which is called user mode helpers. It actually exists inside the kernel to allow it to run some commands in user space. Um, in different scenarios. For example, if a device wants to power off, he wants to do that gracefully, so he wants to run some power off commands uh, in user space to shut down the services nicely before actually uh, powering off the machine. So the orderly power off function does exact, exactly that, and it takes the power off command, which is a global, which is a writable string inside the kernel, and runs that command in user, user space. It also eventually powers off the machine, but it has a flag that allows you to uh, prevent it from doing that. So um, our shell code will basically write over that power of command, whatever commands we want to run in user space, and call uh, the orderly power of function. So it's very simple. So just to recap on the exploit process, what we do is we begin an LGAP connection with a high MTU. That will allow us to send the large packet that uh, Greg showed you before, uh, containing all of these multiple configuration response commands. They will write our shell code to the stack uh, in an unused area on, on the stack, and then also um, override the return address of the function so uh, our, our code will run. The pair will simply write whatever commands we want to run in user space on the power of command, uh, execute the orderly power of function, and finally it will restore execution and the device, device will be unharmed uh, so it will continue to run. In the smartwatch, we had to have a, a different uh, uh, exploit, a, a bit for different exploit. It, it uses the same principles, um, but it does have to do something a bit different. The exploit was develop, developed by a coworker for us, uh, Alon Livne, and it has to bypass the NX bit uh, limitation, so the, the uh, stack cannot be executed in this case, but um, we can do a, a basic uh, warp chain that gives us the right word where primitive, and then we just do the same thing. We write 
um, our um, uh, compile off command with whatever uh, command we want, and then run the orderly power off function, and, uh, and that's, it, that's it. Okay, so we wanted to to take um, take a look at devices that do have mitigations, unlike these specific devices that have stack canaries or KSLR. Um, and this is like really, really new. We found this a week ago, um, and it's actually been, it's a new vulnerability that we found. It's, it's the ninth uh, Bluetooth uh, vulnerability. So it's an information leak vulnerability from the Linux kernel in the same beloved function uh, as we have power of RSP. Um, so this information leak can, can allow attackers to bypass mitigations such as KSLR or stack canaries uh, by leaking pointers or by linking um, the stack canaries um, uh, via Bluetooth connection. So what we can see here is the EFS variable is uninitialized on the stack, and there is a flow in the code that allows us to send it back to the, to the attacker uninitialized in its uninitialized state. Um, the OLEN, uh, you can see there is the input configuration element that is, um, uh, that is being parsed, so the attacker has the control of this uh, length. So it can avoid the memcopy call by sending an EFS element, which is not the size of EFS. And then the memcopy will not occur, but still the EFS variable will be returned to the attacker uh, in the addconf opt function. So this is 16 bytes from the stack, uninitialized, and, and they will have somewhat of a random value, but the attacker can uh, control what value would be on that uninitialized stack by doing prior calls to other functions before calling this function. So he can analyze the stack of this uh, device he's targeting, and he can uh, make sure that in that uninitialized space, the stack canary or uh, other pointers will be uh, placed. So that way he can leak those, uh, that, da that data. And here we can see an example of this being done specifically on the smartwatch um, when we send the configuration response messages uh, that will cause the return of configuration request with the EFS uh, variable with its uninitialized stack variable. And those last eight bytes um, in that hex dump is actually a pointer from the stack. It's a pointer of the code in, the, in that uh, watch. Okay, so we're really close to, to an end here. We're going to do the demo in, in a second. I wanted to just recap on our takeaways from, from this uh, presentation. Um, Bluetooth implementations are really complex. This is like number one, I think. We said that uh, a bunch of times, and it, it, it's true, there was a lot of code. And what we found is that it, it is not examined enough. Um, there are a lot of potential vulnerabilities still there, and this should be uh, rethought and be um, audited. Mitigations in electric devices are not, not actually uh, always implemented. In IoT, this is a very extreme case, but I think that's also true for other, other devices. Uh, so unlike PCs, um, Linux devices sometimes do not use all the mitigations. And this, needs, this needs to be fixed. There is no reason for the default kernel configuration to be so light on mitigations. And lastly, what we also think that should be um, taken from this is that no device, no security mechanisms today actually are looking um, at uh, Bluetooth communications or other non -wi non not Wi-Fi uh, wireless protocols. So any attack that will take, be taking place on these uh, protocols will be completely under the radar for these mechanisms. Um, so so the new solutions need to be put in place to monitor these, mon these potentially vulnerable uh, protocols as well. Okay, so uh, we also have, uh, going to upload just now after the talk, uh, the exploit codes for both the Echo and the Gear, um, the white paper on the exploits, and there was also uh, the previous technical white paper we already published that covers all the vulnerabilities in Bluebone. Okay, so we're going to attempt to do a demo just now. I hope that that works. Um, it basically will, we're going to start with one of the Echoes, I'm not sure which, <laughs> but we're going to see in a minute. Uh, so we're going to establish the Bluetooth connection to it, and then once we run our shell code and we do a, we do a connect back shell just over the Wi-Fi here, so once the attack is, is finished, Bluetooth is no, no, no longer needed, and just over the internet this uh, device can be controlled uh, remotely. Uh, so I hope you can see there, so on the left it's going to run the exploit script. I'm holding my fingers. You should do that too. <laughs> 
So it sends a bunch of these uh, commands, and now we have, uh, we have a shell. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So we upload some scripts to run on the echo, um, and we can uh, see that we are running in root. This is the configuration of the Bluetooth on the specific uh, Amazon Echo. And we can do a bunch of things with it. Um, of course, it's, it's a Linux device. Uh, we can control its LEDs. Here it goes. Now it's green. <laughs> if anyone can see that. Yeah. Um, it's a digital assistant, so we can make it say things also. It's um, <laughs> just for fun. So I can say, Alexa. Alexa. <laughs> My name is Alexa. I have been owned. Take me to your leader. <laughs> okay, I will try to take you to your leader. Um, and now we can also uh, take this attack a, a step further. So what if we want to create some of a botnet of a uh, Bluetooth controlled uh, or um, Blueborn um, controlled uh, devices? We can take over the Bluetooth connect device controller of this Amazon Echo and use it to, to attack another Amazon Echo, the next one over there, um, and then connect them all to our uh, botnet of uh, controlled devices. So the first one will connect back and then the next one will connect back via the internet, and so forth. And each device can then attack another one. So this is, we just created this for our fun, but <laughs> this is just a, the hell scenario for this uh, kind of attack. Um, so this is really just something pretty new, and I'm not sure it's going to work, but we're going to attempt it. So on the right, we can see the connect back shell for the second device, if it will actually connect. Okay, so it has. So now we have control of the second echo on the right. The, the, on the left, it's the first echo. So we have uploaded our, our scripts to it as well. Uh, we can see this is a different device. It has a different MAC address. We can also um, make it with Christmas lights. Here it goes. And they will all together sing our Christmas curl. Alexa. My, My name, name is Alexa. Alexa. I, I have a long ticket. And just to um, wrap it up, we'll, we can also attack the gear. The Samsung gear, it's pretty small, and I don't think we can actually see it from the back, but um, it's over here. So the second, it's actually it's supposed to be here, because the second uh, echo will then <laughs> attack um, the gear as well. Um, and like I said, each one of them, once we run the exploit, connects back via uh, Wi-Fi to, to Greg's uh, laptop over here. Um, so they don't have really to be over here once they are controlled. So um, anybody can just uh, attack one device, and that device can go around attacking other device, and all of them connect back to the to the botnet. So on the right is the is another shell. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so okay, two out of three. But uh, we can try again. We can try again. Which need to restart. Actually, that's a pawn lib bug. As you can see, what uh, Greg is trying to show is that this device has the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi MAC address that are adjacent. So to find the MAC address is pretty simple. Just by pinging the IP of the device, we can have the ARP, uh, its MAC address in the ARP cache, 
So that's the 24920E, that, that one, that's the MAC address of the Wi-Fi, and the Bluetooth is actually just one uh, adjacent to it. So let's try again and attack it, I hope that works. No, but... Of course. Okay, so we don't have any LEDs here or any audio, so you need to trust me, this is actually being pawned right now. But we can reboot it just to show it um, controlled without my hand. Does it reboot? Okay. Okay, I think we have time for a QA. Uh, if anyone wants to ask anything. Um, okay, yeah. Hello, thank you for a really good talk. I just wanted to ask if there is any CVE assigned already for those vulnerabilities, and if for it's being fixed, if it's already fixed in the most recent kernel version. So um, the RC vulnerability uh, is already fixed um, in September. Um, this new vulnerability, the information leak, um, is actually just being fixed today. Like, so in the, there was a CV, and it's also going to be published on our website. So it's really new, the information leak one. Hi, great presentation. Um, I have a question about Android devices where um, the stack is pushed a lot into user space and what your guys' thoughts are on that and if you guys sure. have any research. Um, so we, we did, uh, of course, the exploitation in Android as well for the Bluebone uh, vulnerabilities. Um, it does have a better, it doesn't run in, as root in Android devices, but it also has a lot, a lot of privileges. Um, the Bluetooth stack in any device, but on Android as well, has a lot of features it needs to implement. So you have file sharing and you have uh, uh, the ability to connect a mouse or a keyboard uh, via uh, Bluetooth. So all of these features have privileges inside a stack. Um, so for one example, we just showed on Android the ability to connect a mouse or a keyboard and then you can actually control the UI. Um, that's one avenue to go. But there are also the file, you have a lot of access to the file system. So you do need another step to get to root in Android, but the attack surface is very, very wide since you have a lot of privileges uh, there as well. So doing basic, uh, I don't know, just getting the images of the phone or something, that's like from the start, that's privileges that you have. Uh, but to root it actually, you need to do uh, another step. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, uh, it's a different vulnerability on Android. It's, it's not in the AutoCAP layer, it's in, the, in a different uh, point on the protocol stack. Uh, however, uh, it's still a, a privileged process, not root, but still uh, privileged enough to, to do lots of damage. Um, anyone else? Okay. Uh, hello. Um, so thanks for a great talk, first off. Um, sure. I'd like to talk some more after the talk because I've got a lot of more questions that I can answer right now. Um, I do a lot of industrial control systems. I'm uh, the author behind the horror scenario. Uh, the attack on the power grid via solar panels. And those things work either over Ethernet or over Bluetooth. Do you have any idea whether this will work on those devices? Well, if, if they are based on Linux, if they are running Linux and using the, Bluetooth, the native Bluetooth stack, Blues, yes, they, this will affect them. Um, as I said in the start, Blue, there are eight vulnerabilities that we found and they affect the Android, Windows, iOS, and uh, Linux stacks. So, but there are other stacks other than these, um, not, a, not uh, such a widespread, but industrial devices might have proprietary stacks, stack, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, if they uh, are based on one of these systems, um, they, they will be affected. Other than that, so, uh, like I said, the, the overall feeling is that all implementations can be affected by similar vulnerabilities um, because the stacks have not been audited uh, in quite, quite a long time. 
Yeah, and and uh, what does affect every device that uses Bluetooth is the complexity of the Bluetooth protocol. Yeah, so every stack can be uh, vulnerable uh, because it's pretty complicated. However, uh, you should also know that there is a difference between a, a full Bluetooth stack and a stack that, uh, that only does Bluetooth low energy. It's a pretty different protocol from the ground up, and it has less features and thus is more secure. So if your device has only Bluetooth low energy, it's probably OK. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Anyone? There. Okay, so you guys have got a limited window to uh, explore the undocumented communication between the Echo and the mothership, which a lot of people would like to understand. Because it's locked down to an Amazon certificate, uh, people can't just kind of put a, a Wireshark uh, intercept or any, anything in there. But with your exploit, you could actually do that. Have you got any plans to kind of look at that area? Can you get anyone the last part of the question? Well, because the, all the communication that the Echo makes back to Amazon is over SSL, and it uses a cert that's signed hmm. by Amazon, so you can't just basically kind of intercept that Amazon. traffic. But you guys could, now that you've got root on that device, you could use that to, to, to figure it out. A lot of people would like to know how that, how that works. <laughs> so okay. we are going to release the exploit, so you were welcome to take it out and do with it, whatever. But you should note that Amazon Echo receives automatic updates and it's all been, been updated. I think that probably you can um, just buy a new Echo that hasn't been updated yet, and then you can use this to get root in order to research it further. Yeah, well, th this vuln for which uh, the, we're the exploit that is going to be on our GitHub it will work on the uh, previous version of the Echo, the previous software version. So if you can somehow revert that, or uh, you, you'll, you'll get root on your Echo. So, can I ask your suggestion for preventing for the for the problems like this uh, from Bluetooth implementation? I mean, for example, we can make a better implementation for Bluetooth stacks, or like on the presentation, adding uh, some kind of a special secure mechanism, the monitoring mechanism on the Bluetooth stacks, like on Bluetooth stack on like a S like a specific SA Linux for Bluetooth, the silly <laughs> name, but just for example. So, what is your suggestion? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Basically, there are two things. First of which is um, just use BLE <laughs> unless you need the full Bluetooth. Second, uh, it's it's uh, the concept of lowest privilege. Okay. Say uh, it showed really well on Android and here on Linux as well. Uh, but on Android, there is a single daemon that has all the privileges of everything Bluetooth does. So the same daemon can be an HID keyboard, it can look at your pictures, it can do like attach network interfaces, crazy stuff, right? But there is no reason that a, a vulnerability in only one of these things will allow you to control all of these privileges. So it shouldn't be one daemon, it shouldn't be in the kernel, it should be many separated low privilege processes uh, that do only their particular thing. I think I would add to that, add to that is that we are very um, custom to the concept of firewalls in TCP connections and IP connections, but there are no such firewalls in uh, Bluetooth connections. So the services are always listening, and there is no way to stop them from listening or to limit their connections. And also, I think uh, in solutions that are looking at the protocol on the side, just uh, analyzing the data, can also find very valuable um, and can also potentially block um, threats uh, from, from not, not inside your device, but outside of the device as well. Quick question, questions, please. Um, would you say that your, the way you built your exploit would affect all CPU architectures equally? Excuse me, can you CPU architectures, yeah. Um, oh. I think each exploit usually needs to be adjusted, adapted a little bit. Um, it, it won't be automatically. Um, even the Amazon Echo, if you go to a different firmware version, you need to adjust some of the uh, variables. But our, our job was not to make this a weaponized uh, nation-grade uh, exploit, um, although sometimes we, we dream of that. <laughs> 
um, but more like to show a, a proof concept of that. So any um, actor that, that wishes to, to take advantage of these vulnerabilities uh, in, the, in the highest manner, in the, uh, he can do that. He can uh, make the exploit uh, generic or just uh, customize it to a very wide uh, variety of uh, devices. Thank you. So essentially you're saying it's possible, it just needs to be customized. Yeah. And the second question, you mentioned um, monitoring. Would you have any suggestion how you monitor mobile devices at all times? I don't I think I understand. You, you mean so your, your phone is essentially a mobile device. You oh. carry it around. How would you monitor that? Yeah, so there is a number of ways. There, there is the, uh, the way that you probably think about it, just spread hardware around the organization that monitors Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Such things exist for Wi-Fi. I think they're called the wireless APS, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose they do kind of this, this thing. Uh, so uh, if, if you monitor all these uh, protocols that your devices expose to the air, then uh, you'll have at least a, a window into seeing what's actually going on and, and be able to control. Yeah, but our company also does, uh, does this specifically, uh, monitors uh, Bluetooth communications as well, uh, either via uh, specific hardware that we deploy or with some uh, integration to existing infrastructure in your organization. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, I don't suppose I can ask a favor. Would you be able to put the URLs for your white paper back up? Because I didn't get them down in time. <laughs> uh, which one? That was a little bit. Why must not? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Also here, uh, there, there was also a, a white paper and uh, a presentation video in, in another uh, venue yeah. we went to about Android. Uh, a white paper also exists there. Uh, if, you, if you go to our GitHub, you'll find uh, all of this there next uh, tomorrow or so. Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, half it's an hour? Not, it's it not up show. there. It's uh, still got the uh, black hat background. Well, come, come yeah. to us later. And <laughs> Okay. Else? okay. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs>